and um, I am going to be here. I'm just going to turn my video off and my um, sound off, but I will still be here if you need anything. So passing it over to you, I'm sure that you know much more about what to do um, than I. So here we go. All good. Thank you, Irene. So uh, well, welcome everybody. Uh, to the April uh, Indicator of Behavior Working Group meeting. Um, I'm Charlie Frick, as I said, from APL, and with me is uh, Ladrina Chern uh, from Cyber Reason. We're your, uh, your co-chairs for the working group, and happy to have folks here today, and wanted to, you know, uh, we're gonna have, uh, we're very lucky to have uh, Mr. Carter Bullard here from uh, Quotient to talk about some uh, tools and concepts for network behavior analysis. Uh, as we've been looking for the past few sessions, we've done a lot of talk on some of uh, my research on machine readable objects for representing adversary behavior. But we think that in the realm of understanding different ways to indicate and describe behavior, we want to get some more fresh perspectives in. So uh, Ladrina, was there, any uh, items you wanted to address? Yeah, thank you, Charlie. Uh, I think you covered it. Um, just welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. And uh, Carter, pleased to uh, to hear from you during our meeting today. All righty. Well, with that said, uh, Carter, if that's a good enough uh, setup for you, I'm happy to hand the baton to you and let you uh, let you go. Oh, that's great. That's great. So um, I get I put together some slides. I think I'll just uh, grab the screen and just put those up and talk for you said 30 minutes is about how we want to slice and dice. Yeah, it, that'll be right? good. That'll give us some time for Q&A and a couple of general uh, housekeeping discussions and stuff. OK, well, even though I have slides, this is a really a very informal, friendly sort of presentation about some work I've done over the last three or four years. Um, primarily focused on a pilot project at DHS, uh, one of the component socks there. So um, putting together slides and talking about them, sometimes it sounds like a lecture. I don't want to lecture <laughs> so much as I'd like to just talk about the work and bring up some, the, some of the interesting issues that came up during the DHS project. And I hope it can inform the group as to some of the complexities of doing behavioral analytics and how to use um, anomaly detection to try to find the bad guys. But hopefully it could also kind of present maybe a pos an approach that might solve some of our questions we've had in the last couple of meetings, like what's a behavior and what is it that we should be trying to track or develop or process in order to do behavioral indications as leading indicators to cyber behavior. So let me grab the screen and try to share this. Is that what I want? I think that's it. Is that it? Uh, we see, yeah, we see PowerPoint with uh, crosshair on it. That's good. Because then if I hit this, you should just see the slides, right? Perfect. OK, good. So, um, and because it's informal, if anything comes up, I may not see the hands go up or if there's a question, Charlie, if you could see it, just interrupt me and we'll try Absolutely. to talk to anything. All right, so um, I wanted to talk about practical behavioral anomaly detection, just to try to highlight some of the issues uh, that come up when you try to use it as a primary scheme for finding the bad guys on large enterprise. And so um, I've done a little bit of research work in my career. I've been doing this kind of stuff for about 35 years, and I've had the privilege to work with some really prestigious organizations. And I just thought I'd mention a few of them. The Sandia um, reference right here for the US National Labs, uh, last year, 2021, got a chance to work on some satellite system um, cyber protection schemes in the TCARS um, project under, I think that's Starks. And this, is, this was a great one because in satellite systems, you don't get to see an awful lot. You may not have very much data. And so you wanna use behavioral techniques to try to see if someone is screwing around with the satellite. So that was a very, very informative project that I worked on for about a year. But this DHS Elimination of Unmonitored Space program is the one I'm gonna focus on because it was designed to do, use almost 
behavioral anomaly detection is the only indicator in a large enterprise to try to find out if somebody's doing something bad. But I've been a co-PI at the NSF in flow-based systems, and um, I've been doing work with the NSA and other organizations for quite a number of years. So I think I've got a sense of what people want to find, but of course, no matter where you work, you're not gonna be able to see it all. So hopefully this can just be a guide as to my experience and so that you can see maybe a justification for my approach for what I was doing. Now, one of the things that I'm kind of known for is that I invented um, what people call as NetFlow. So I did that in the early eighties at Georgia Tech, took it, to the computer emergency response team at Carnegie Mellon, where we converted flow systems into incident response technology. And um, Cisco picked it up in the early 90s and grabbed the name NetFlow, so they get all the credit, but we were in the background developing the technology. So, uh, so everything that I talk about is really flow-based technology and, and things that are derived from wireline network observation. So I'm a network guy and I like network behavior. And so I would, wanted to give you guys a presentation on, on what might be practical network behavioral anomaly detection, behavioral awareness, and how you might be able to use that um, in the, our indications of behavioral working group here. So I, I thought I'd talk about what is behavior, what's the history behind it, where does it come from? Maybe that can inform us on some approaches to doing behavioral anomaly detection. And then I wanted to talk about the problems in this DHS uh, component uh, SOC and how we uh, found some really interesting things that might help us to um, give us a path down, down this kind of rocky road, so to speak. All right. Most people think of behavior as a psychology thing, and that's not where it came from. It came from this concept of ethology. Now, does anybody on the call know, has ever heard of the word ethology? And I would venture no. <laughs> it's, not the, it's not the kind of thing that, you know, just leaps out. You know, you don't see it too much on television, so you're not going to think of ethology. But ethology is a science of behavior. And it was kind of started peripherally by Charles Darwin in, in the late 1800s when he, after his big push in natural selection, he started talking about or writing about uh, comparisons of animal behavior and man behavior. And that became the basis for what has, is known now today as ethology. And on uh, that third bullet, these are the primary names that have evolved the concept of ethology and have made it a, a scientific discipline. And um, almost all of the ethological work that's out there is all on animal behavior. Um, but we have, if we're gonna do something about um, cyber behavior and do analytics and try to provide some scientific basis for the act, uh, any kind of analytics that we wanna do, I think we should grab something that has a long-winded basis in science, has a lot of um, thought into it. So I will grab ethology. It's the first thing I grab. And the key element here in this is, uh, if you can see my um, pointer, is this word right here, the ethogram. Now, I know if you haven't heard of ethology, you haven't heard of ethograms. So it's a really important word. It is the basis of the entire discipline of, of ethology. And if you can develop an ethogram for your behavior, then all of this history can in some ways apply to what you wanna do. Now, these three guys, Tinberg, Lawrence, and Von Frisch actually won a Nobel Prize and stuff. So we, this is good stuff. We don't wanna not pay attention to ethology. Now, my interest is to convert the discipline of animal behavior into machine behavior, and, it, and it's all centered around this concept of the ethogram, and, it, and the ethogram is a catalog or an inventory of behaviors, all right? When you start talking about cyber behaviors and large enterprises, it's open. I mean, it is huge. Millions of potential behaviors may be involved in a break-in um, or in an exploitation or just a vulnerability. But, um, but to give it some kind of um, focus, uh, we want to make sure the behaviors are defined with a small number of criteria. For the most part, in an ethogram, behaviors are active expressions 
of things. <laughs> if it moves, that's a behavior. If it blinks its eye, that's a behavior. If, if it shifts its head left and right, that's a behavior. But it's always active, right? Um, the ethogram is a collection of active, uh, exhibited actions by entities, and it needs to be objective in that it needs to avoid subjectivity and functional inference and bias in statistical analysis, right? And the key element here is that it's hard to use uh, intrusion detection outcomes to develop ethograms because an intrusion detection is a subjective interpretation of things in an enterprise. It's saying this is bad. And you gotta take that out in order to do a lot of these behavioral analytics and uh, take the approach of, of ethology. So that's a hard thing to do when you're a cybersecurity person is to take the bad part out. But we're gonna have to try to do that in the kind of metrics and the kind of things that we wanna measure. Uh, in the network to do this kind of uh, uh, discipline. All right, and the thing needs to be unambiguous. You need to be able to have a very reliable obs observational approach to behavioral um, analysis, descriptions, and things like that. Generally, ethograms are hierarchical and taxonomic. That's great because that's how we think about cybersecurity behaviors is that they're hierarchical. And um, Ethograms have evolved in the last 50 years to provide statistical descriptions as well as Markov chain probabilities and behaviors when they're complex behaviors. So ethology is pretty sophisticated and it does touch on the kind of analytics that we want to do, we want to think about, especially when you look at things like the um, MITRE attack framework where you go from one attack strategy to the next, to the next, to the next, that builds up uh, an intrusion. So, oh, I'm sorry, Ladrina. Yeah, a, a quick question on uh, the last point here, mentioning uh, ex exhibited actions. Yeah. And I, I feel like I suspect you might be going into this. So please feel free to defer my question if that's the case. Okay. But I wonder in exhibited actions, you know, a lot of what we talk about in our space is unknown behaviors. Oh, absolutely. So yeah. if, if, you know, we have that animal who's shaking its head left and right. Well, the great thing is a lot of our systems today might say, well, you're shaking your head left and right. Maybe this animal is going to shake its head up and down. Um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So the notion is, you know, well, what does that kind of imply? It implies that you have an ethogram that describes all the known observed behaviors and this shaking left and right has never been seen before. So somehow you have to capture the characteristics of that shaking your head left and right. And then you have to look it up in your historical ethogram to realize that nobody's ever seen this before, you know. And the concepts of the theory of cybersecurity, if there, if you can imagine that there's a theory of cybersecurity, is that something has modified an in-system or some aspect of the enterprise and it's going to do unique behavior. So let's get into that. All right, let's see how we're going to figure that one out, right? So uh, let's see if I can make my arrows go left and right here. Is that the right one? No, I'm going the wrong direction. Uh, I'm way going in the wrong direction. Hold on. I'm hitting the arrows, but it decided just to go straight. So I'm gonna start over again. Uh, all right, let's try that again. Okay, so... Um, I'm not going to answer your question directly in the couple, first couple of slides, but I'll get to them as we go along. Okay, but so what's machine behavior? Um, cybersecurity people seem to think they know what machine behavior is, but it's not, it's not necessarily intuitive exactly what machine behavior is. Um, cybersecurity activity is modeled as virtual criminal behavior, digital gaming. I like to talk about it as computer morbidity and mortality. You know, the concept that break-ins into computers aren't really necessarily criminal. It may just be kind of an expression of disease, computer disease. You know, this guy's susceptible to this kind of a virus. And so he gets that kind of flu, right? Just happens to be a humans behind it. But the behavior behind these machine uh, relevant conditions it's, it seems that it should be very intuitive, but, but it may not be, right? Uh, there's 
was a paper in 2019 that talked about machine behavior in nature, right? And it's the first paper that I can find that actually talks about the concept that machines are independent uh, entities that may have their own unique behaviors. This paper is about AI and the emergence of AI and its impact on humans. And uh, it's getting into the whole concept of the um, ethics of machine behavior from an AI perspective. But as a cybersecurity person, we've been dealing with machine behavior from the very beginning. The notion that this is attack behavior, this is aggressive behavior. This guy is scanning this machine, trying to find a vulnerability. And so I think cybersecurity people can grab this Nature article and expand on it in a much more interesting way than what the AI guys wanted to talk about. So I highly recommend people read this paper. It's not very big and it's not very long. It talks about some new concepts. But for us, the best part of machine behavior is normal mach machine behavior. Um, I like AB normal from the, what is the Young Frankenstein movie, Abby normal. Um, but abnormal behavior is, is, of course, the counter to the normal behavior, operable, performant, default, idle, instinctual, matured, learning. These are, be these are behavioral descriptions. And these are all things that tend to be a part of a general taxonomy of behavior. But as you go down this list, you all of a sudden find familiar, unfamiliar, friendly and unfriendly victim behavior, bad actor behavior. Um, these are all legitimate taxonomies. And I put these four at the end because these are seen to be more generalized about that re refer to cyber behavior, victim behavior, bad actor behavior. Victim behavior is really the transformation of an end system uh, after he's been attacked or penetrated or new malware has been placed on the system and now he's offering something like a port for access, that would be a victim behavior. He's somehow different in that he responds to pings in a slightly different way or he's a victim. But a bad actor is someone who actually uses attack behavior to actually um, challenge another machine on the enterprise network or is actually trying to um, find a vulnerability in a host. So these things are become relevant and generally find them themselves into uh, ethograms and ethograph, etho, ethological analysis. All right, so, and why behavior, All right? And then we'll, I'll get to some specific things. So there is a theory of cybersecurity that this applies to, and it's a Bell LaPagula model of cybersecurity. I don't know how many people are familiar with Bell LaPagula, but it's a very old concept, early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. And it talks about the concept that all things are secure until something puts pressure on a system to transform it to an insecure state. And that you can um, actually track the, the, the stages of the change. Um, now, Bella Pagela was all about uh, authentication and access control, but you can apply their concepts to any aspect of, of cybersecurity, I think, and I've really enjoyed it. But in practice, the concept is that we want to use behavior because signature-based detection suck, and we need something new and different. All right, so we're going to go into this world of we want to see changes in the network or changes in the way that applications respond or changes in what we perceive the user to be doing in the enterprise as an indication of a break in. So the theory leads us to this concept the signature based detections are going to have shortcomings and the behavioral analytics are going to save the day. And oh, I'm hoping that they will save the day. So. Um, and behaviors imply chains of observables like kill chains. Uh, there are works and taxonomies being developed. MITRE's got the, a good one. There are several others out there. MITRE is the most popular right, right now. And of course, it seems so simple, right? Everybody seems to think that a compromise is the result of attacks that are sets of behaviors comprised of a large number of observables. That just sounds like an easy sentence that comes out and, and covers everything. But if you turn your behavioral methods simply into high order signature pattern recognition, it's, it will also fail. So you need to take yourself out of this concept of, I'm gonna put the list of the things that I'm expecting to see in that, and I'm gonna call that a break-in, or I'm gonna call that 
uh, a fish, or I'm going to call that some kind of ransomware behavior. You need to make sure that we don't, with behavioral um, anomaly detection or behavioral analytics, turn them into signatures and pattern matchers, because then they will have the same problem that we have with strings, searching, and things like that in, in the network. All right, that, that's what I wanted to say about behavior. Uh, it leads us to things like the Lockheed Martin kill chain, where we see that there's reconnaissance, weaponization, delivery, exploitation, installation, command and control. These are all the things that we're looking for. Um, and the idea is we want to find behaviors in the network that reflect these actions. We don't necessarily want to be looking only for reconnaissance, but we want to find basic behaviors in the network that can be interpreted as being reconnaissance, such as I'm going to send a ping packet to the broadcast address. That's a behavior, right? It, uh, what the network does as a result of that is everybody on the network responds, right? And so the reconnaissance is realized in the network because with a single packet, he could discover everybody on the local area network. So broadcast pings are a behavior. Has, has, do, do you see that every day? Does this end system ever done that before? Does it do it always at two o'clock? Now he's doing it at 2.15, is that different? Is that important? These are the kind of things that you have to think about when you want to approach this problem. I wanna look at basic behaviors in the network. I don't wanna necessarily be looking for weaponization and exploitation specifically, but I wanna find behaviors that will allow me to identify reconnaissance and identify command and control and to identify delivery, but without necessarily looking for specific signatures of these things. Okay, now Argus is a project that I've had for quite a number of years, and it's really the first network flow sensor flow monitor. It's a top 100 security tool in the internet, and it's designed to look at packets and generate an audit trail of what's going on in the network. And that's different from something like Zeek, uh, Suricata, um, QRadar types of uh, systems. Um, because they are really detectors. They're trying to make statements about what they see in the network um, with that sense that this is a cybersecurity relevant event. Argus is, doesn't know anything about um, break-ins and uh, um, vulnerabilities. It's trying to audit what it sees on the network and it's trying to account for every packet on the wire. So it's trying to capture the transactions and report on them or store them somewhere so that later on you can realize what was going on in the network. Uh, it's been used primarily for forensics, post-incident forensics and analysis. Um, but its purpose is really to try to capture the essence of what's on the network because a break-in, uh, the knowledge that a break-in occurred sometimes is months and months and months later, do you realize? And if you want to analyze it and investigate it. You have to go back in time to try to understand how you can recreate what the context of what was going on in the enterprise to try to figure out how did they get in? What was the extent of the damage? Are they still active in the network? And so Argus was designed to be an audit system, not a detection system. And that makes it a very interesting piece of technology when it comes to behavioral analysis, because it takes out that bias in terms of I'm not saying that this is bad. I'm just saying that this happened. And if I can turn that into a data source for doing something like an, uh, a new detector, then I think it's a really good strategy that can be exploited. All right, questions so far on this? So we have some behavior. We know we need to go after some basic behavior in the network if we're gonna do um, behavioral anomaly detection. We can't have bias. We need to be somewhat, um, scientific and have an approach to it. And then we have this sensor that creates this audit trail. So the, the idea is, can we convert that audit trail into technology that can help us with behavioral anomaly detection? Now, Argus has about 170 to 200 metrics in every flow record that it generates for activity in the network, right? Its purpose is to, I saw a packet that was a part of this TCP connection. And I've got a lot of interesting properties related to that 
packet or that flow that I'm going to stick on the disk that is going to allow me to realize what it was doing in the network at some other time. And I can use this data to make statements about presence and occurrence in the network. This IP address was talking to this IP address Tuesday at 4.15.27 in the afternoon. Um, if you structure the data right and you process it in an interesting way, you can keep up with who's talking to who. So, and, and then you can keep up with this guy normally talks to 50 guys every day. And these are the kind of behaviors that become really revealing in terms of, is this guy doing something different today than he did in the last 180 days? So if we have a lot of in information and we have a lot of um, uh, characteristics and attributes about that, we can build up really complex views into what a particular um, application or a particular endpoint or a particular group of endpoints are supposed to be doing in, a, in, in the network. Argus uh, reports on flows. It reports on uh, a lot of aspects of those flows. From the addresses, you can get the CIDR addresses, the autonomous system numbers, countries. Um, from the other uh, tuples in the five tuple um, strategy, the data schema that flow records use, you can get the services that they're using. Argus actually collects some content. So you can actually ask the question, is this the right protocol running on this particular uh, port? Uh, which is really important because there's a lot of policy that is implied in a network. And if you collect the right kind of data, you can ask questions like, is this conforming to the policy that this network is designed to support? Um, there's a lot of information there to talk about the character of the communications. This guy is talking directly to uh, a set of peers. It, that's unicast traffic. It means I'm talking directly to a specific uh, endpoint. Multicast traffic is really important for understanding um, network behaviors such as um, he's advertising the availability of a service. He would use multicast or broadcast to do that. Um, and through multicast, uh, 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 you might be able to discover a lot of things in the network that you may not have thought about, but sometimes somebody's just broadcasting and advertising lots and lots of things that reveal uh, the identity of endpoints. And it's interesting to know that endpoints are doing that. So Argus data captures then uh, those aspects and those characters of the communication so that you can analyze that later. Uh, low demand, the frequency and period this periodicity. These are the one things that everybody seems to really latch onto. This IP address sent 14 million packets to everybody it talked to yesterday. Um, and the question is, is that different or is that the same as it does every day? Well, the only way that you can know that is to have a long history of the counts of um, packets for that IP address. If you do have the history, now you can really have some way of saying that this guy is doing something different. And so Argus, like many flow systems, but Argus in particular has a lot of metrics and a lot of behaviors that it um, extracts out of the packets and the streams that it's watching. And in its data, and it's a data schema and the attributes that it uh, assigns to flow records, you can make some specific um, statements about the presence, the character of the communications, its load and its demands and its frequencies. We've invented a lot of security uh, metrics in Argus over the years. One is the producer consumer ratio, which is a really interesting measure of whether you're sending things as a general rule or are you reading or consuming things from the internet. Um, and of course, we have observed behaviors like keystroke detection and um, specific security behavior, uh, such as uh, fragmentation overlap detection and things like that in the sensors. So we actually have some specific behavioral metrics as well. So if you, so the idea is that you want to look at the enterprise and at the network activity that's going on. You want to put a sensor in that environment, and you want to start to um, generate summarizations of audit data in that network so that you can start to realize 
well, who's talking to who? What kind of communications do they use? How often do they do it? And do they send a lot of data? Do they send a little bit, little bit of data? Because the theory of cybersecurity intrusion is that if someone modifies an endpoint uh, to do something other than what it's supposed to do, its behavior will change and the network activity that that endpoint is gonna express in the network is, gonna, is also gonna change. And if you have enough attributes and enough um, um, characteristics of the communications, then you can detect that a significant change has occurred. And that's what we are trying to do with uh, Argus flow sensing and behavioral anomaly detection. So, so how does this get back to ethograms and ethology and all that kind of stuff? So I, I know this is kind of a long-winded sort of pass, but the idea is that ethology invented this thing called the ethogram. And the ethogram is designed to capture all the behaviors of an entity. The, if we wanted to understand a chickadee, for instance, you know, we don't really know much about chickadees. We know what it sounds like though, right? It goes, uh, and it has a, one other kind of thing that it does. But uh, if we hear that, well, hey, we know there's a chickadee around, you know? And that is captured in a chickadee's ethogram. The, the entire vocalizations of birds, they have ethograms for um, the, the, the songbirds and what they emanate. And you can do um, bird classifications based on that. And the idea is we want the same kind of thing in a sensor or in a system inside the network that gives us the same power that we get out of ethology. So we need to be able to have a thing called an ethogram. So if we take all these flow records and we process them, we may be able to generate a structure that represents the ethogram for an end point, an end system in the network, all right? That may be a hard jump between packets and flows and ethology. So does anybody have any questions so far about that? And I, anybody got anything? So far, so good? Okay, so far, so good. So Argus has a bunch of tools in the open source software that's available to reduce all this flow data that it generates for what's going on in the network to create what we call data aggregations. And the, and the flexibility in those aggregations allow us to have what you would say are um, views into the data. Uh, we can change uh, the relational algebraic schemas that we use to create flow records and we can start to create aggregations of those um, activities and start to build up um, representative uh, representations of the behavior of specific behavior of endpoints. As an example, we can take all the flow records that are involved a particular IP address and we can aggregate them together to get the total number of packets and bytes that a particular address sent or received. Right now, that's a great statistic to have when you want to ask the question: Has this is this guy different than he was yesterday? I, I want to make sure that nobody's broken into him and is starting to move traffic around. I, I don't want I'll, to miss the idea that someone is staging data to this endpoint in expectation of an exfiltration. So I want to know want to make sure that I'm accounting for all the packets and the bytes that go in and out of each IP address in my enterprise. And if I see uh, a spike in the amount of packets that go in and out, just because the number goes up doesn't mean that there's something bad going on, but nothing bad can go on without a change in those values. So the idea is to be able to have a behavioral approach to understanding differences in the network and then to build up those changes into a case or into some kind of a explanation as to whether this behavior is reasonable or if it reflects or represents a break-in. Um, you wanna be able to merge like all the DNS flows from a, uh, going to a particular destination address. That sounds really simple and it is uh, if you have flow records for every DNS transaction that is seen in the network. And what you can do with that 
is this particular rule reflects the DNS servers. The destination addresses are the servers. And one of the ways that people break into enterprises is they set up proxy or rogue DNS servers, get the clients to go to those DNS servers, and then um, give up bad addresses for the names they look up. So the idea of a rogue DNS server being able to detect that it's really a behavior. He's going to a different DNS server than he was talking to yesterday. Uh, you need to have a history of all the DNS servers, all the clients that talk to them, so that you can understand that this particular client is now talking to a new DNS server. And the idea is if you have transactional data for every transaction in the network and you process it appropriately and store that in a long-term store, then you can ask the question, is this DNS transaction anomalous? And is it anomalous because he's going to a different DNS server? Um, the idea of looking at an enterprise all at once, you wanna be able to say, you know, I, I really wanna track the total number of packets and bytes that are going out of the enterprise, going to anywhere in the internet. So if I see it, so that I can look at a single metric and have a sense that something significant has changed. And so baselines need to be flexible and need to be um, able to be based in some kind of algebraic or relational sort of rule set so that you can aggregate upon aggregation upon aggregation. So you can have very simple things to look at and say, hey, I think something has changed in this enterprise today and I need to dive into it. The reason you need to do that is because some enterprises are made up of a million in endpoints. Some of these banks have a million virtual machines in their enterprises. And if you want to realize that there is some kind of behavior going on in that enterprise that is different based possibly because of a break-in, it's hard to do it looking at a million addresses at a time. You need to be looking at something else. You need to be looking at a higher view with a more general behavioral sort of uh, expression so that you can get a leading indicator to change that allows you then to drill down so that you can find something uh, that's relevant or important. So the idea behind Argus baselines is that we can take all the flow data that we generate in the network, if it's well developed and well formed, and we can create a number of metrics that we're going to track. And we're going to track them for a long period of time so that we can understand what fundamentally is changing in this in environment. And then if we use uh, this concept of the ethogram in a general sort of way, we may be able to generate literally thousands to millions of ethograms for an enterprise to track the behaviors that are going on inside the enterprise. Now that's a big jump. And that's something that puts the concept of ethology into a practical aspect for doing cyber security detections in a large enterprise. So the idea is let's set up a couple of basic metrics. Let's track it for every asset in the enterprise and then let's see if we can't find a structured way to find change in this in this in, uh, in this uh, world that we're in. Okay, so um, that leads me to this program that we did at DHS, and um, I know I've gone over my time, uh, but let me get through this real quick. Charlie, is that okay? Sure, we can give you. We can probably do about another ten minutes. Ten minutes. All right, real quick. So under the guidance of uh, Jaime Vargas and Robert Moore, who are the CISOs in this small component uh, of DHS, we decided that we were going to try to do behavioral anomaly detection inside the component, and which meant that we needed to do some interesting um, uh, instrumentation. Uh, we basically put flow sensors in a bunch of endpoints in and in work group edges. And then we collected all the flow data and then we went looking for some bad guys based on behavioral anomaly detection. And uh, the problem that was very that we were trying to solve was very simple. And that was that they had a lot of bring your own devices to work scenarios. So there were a lot of devices where you did not see um, all of the traffic 
that the components were um, experienced. And they were moving around so that the, the protection environment for each of these endpoints changed on a daily basis. They took them home so they don't have the access control schemes. And um, so they were susceptible and vulnerable to lots of different kinds of attack. Now we went down this path because many of the components in uh, large enterprise networks do have entry points for malware that don't go through the traditional pathways. So we have to assume that we're not gonna see the initial break-in. So we have to look for something else to say that we think this guy may be uh, may have some malware on them. So uh, our primary thing is to look for bad actor activity. We want to see lateral movement detection inside the local network. We want to make sure that we put a sensor somewhere where we can see it. And if we can see something like uh, lateral movement, then that's the leading indicator to say that we have new malware in the enterprise and we have to do something about it. So that, that was the problem. And we... Um, did. We were pretty successful. We distributed a bunch of sensors through onto endpoints as well as workgroup edges. And we developed some sense making and decision making around behavioral anomaly detection. And it was all focused on this concept of develop an inventory, develop baselines for about 15 specific metrics, and then classify the endpoints based on those baselines and then see if we can find somebody that's acting in an aberrant sort of way, right? This is the way, this is kind of a diagram of how it worked. Um, the little maroon squares are the sensors um, and whether it's in a switch or a router or in a bastion sensor or whether it's in an endpoint, that's, that's the only thing that's a, uh, different in how those purple kind of maroon squares are represented. All the data goes to a central point where we do a bunch of analytics trying to see if we can't figure out what's going on. Now, um, the kinds of um, persistent baselines that we created, we, there were basically two fundamental data schemas that we developed. One was let's track every IP address that we see and then let's track every communicating pair that we see. And then from those two daily um, schemas that we generated, let's see if we can figure out about 14 behavioral baselines that we can track. And from there, let's see if we can get a good cover for um, um, the MITRE attack matrix from this data. And uh, we actually found a lot of really bad stuff in these enterprises. I don't mean to say that they weren't doing a good job in protection, but there was a lot of stuff going on in some of these enterprise networks that people just don't know about. Um, but to put it in perspective, we ended up looking at a subcomponent at DHS that had about five or 6,000 endpoints, and it generated about 2 million IP addresses, V4 and V6 addresses that were referenced in a given day, either externally or internally. Um, 8,000 active internal IP addresses that were important that we tracked on a, day, on a detailed sort of basis. And then the pair, we looked at the pairs of addresses, the communicating pairs, and that ended up being about three and a half million communicating pairs a day which is 400,000 internally and about 28,000 daily, every day there were 28,000 active pairs that we could rely on. And um, so this generated about, um, I, I think I can, I don't think I have a slide that says specifically what those numbers were, um, but it ended up being about 40,000 base, I mean, 40 million baselines that we were tracking inside the enterprise. Uh, 60 million baselines that we added, some of the really exotic ones. But so for a relatively reasonable size enterprise, we had an information system that was tracking about 60 million behavioral baselines in order to try to understand if there were any differences going on on a daily basis. We did use a day because that's a really good thing. It, it, it basically gets the whole computational cycle. There's the background stuff, there's the human driven stuff and it's periodic. So we, we focused on daily behaviors as uh, the thing to watch. So let's see, ah, I have to, sorry, real quick, let me get back. Uh, I apologize. 
the success stories that we had, we found a bunch of zero day malware coming in on laptops. All right, Kofter as a is a type of malware. It's a vehicle for malware development. So a, you see an awful lot of uh, similar break-ins because they're based on the same Kofter framework. Um, and um, they are tend to be command control and exfiltration of um, registry information. So Kofter uh, was something that we saw very quickly and we saw several instances of Kofter inside this enterprise. The way that it, it expressed itself was the number of countries that the entire enterprise interacted with in a given day went from about 30 countries to 145. It always went from about 20 to 30 to some order of magnitude higher. Now, the reason countries is it's a random process. The malware doesn't know that it's going to Algeria or Antarctica. Uh, it's just that the random addresses that it used mapped randomly into countries. And so it became a very interesting number and it was very, very consistent. So Kofter equaled large numbers of references to IP addresses in many countries. Um, we actually found a lot of exfiltration scenarios that we didn't expect using simple techniques. One of those techniques is just counting the number of peers that each IP address talked to in a given day. Um, we did cluster analysis on the number of peers on a daily basis and found a class of IP ad uh, addresses inside the, 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 the component that all seemed to be talking to a specific slash 24 subnet in a very particular way. And it ended up being these were printers that we're sending data outside the enterprise every time a print uh, was done. So that became a very interesting uh, thing and opened up some real opportunities for investigating exfiltration that nobody expected to see. And that was an in-degree classification, number of peers that individuals talked to and the durations of the transactions that they did. They all clustered together to say, here's a body of IP addresses inside this enterprise that seem to be curious and a, and a problem, right? So the idea is that we have some basic metrics. We can do some basic analytics and some machine learning or some kind of statistical analytics that are interesting. And we can start to make statements about the differences between this endpoint and itself over time or this endpoint and other endpoints within the organization. And then the third most important one that we saw is this detection of abnormal control plane activity. Now, this is an interest, very interesting one because um, Microsoft endpoints tend to do something really weird. They'll, they'll look up a DNS uh, query with the local DNS server. And then at the end of the day, they ask Google for the same address, right? Now, in many DNA, DHS environments, they don't allow those transactions to occur. So those DNS servers uh, requests should fail. And they do, they all did. We turned that into an, a detector for policy verification. And one day there was an instance in which all of the external DNS requests started to succeed. And that was one of the, the most successful detections that we had at DHS, where we detected through simple behavioral anomaly detection, control uh, access control policy failure. And it was because we used a simple behavioral indicator inside the enterprise and turned it into a detection scheme for policy. Now, that was huge. Uh, for DHS as a, in general, because this kind of thing was going on and nobody had any idea that it was going on. So, and it was a bypass that they weren't going, they weren't using the topological constraint they were supposed to. They went to another um, link to go to the outside and all the access controls failed. Okay, and this is what it looked like. All of these are failures and then all of a sudden the failures went to zero. So it's not easy to imagine how you can predict this is going to be the behavior you're going to do in an enterprise, but these are the techniques that are the most successful at finding the bad guy. All right, what are the impacts for OCA and IOB? I think that 
you know, it's, this is all about behavioral information sharing, right? So, you know, who's the producer and the consumer of the data? You know, are these, it, can you, can we capture the concept that we turned a detector, we created a new detector out of these behaviors and found a bad guy because of a change in the detectors? Those need to be somehow captured and supported in the sticks and taxi data schemas that we want to use, you know? So, I think we need to somehow be able to talk about the purpose of the data, you know, and, and capture in the data schemas for sticks and taxi that, hey, this data is intended to be a behavior that does this, 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 and this, and then somehow capture um, the idea of um, what the probabilities of detection are these good detectors, uh, What's the context in which this information was generated? Is it and, and what are the operational responses of the data? But one of the most important things that we had, I think that this work highlights is that sticks and taxi data schemas that we are, are gonna start to share, they need to be able to have normal behavior in them, not detections of bad behavior, but just normal behavior. And I think we also have to be able to describe how is the behavior measured. I mean, Char Charlie, you had a bunch of stuff from your last talk in which Zeke was involved, right? Well, it's only going to be useful to another organization if they have the same sensing capability in their infrastructure, right? So sure. somehow we have to be able to describe, we detect this through these mechanisms. And if you have those mechanisms, then this shared information is going to be relevant to you. I think that's what I got. Oh, the conclusions are um, behaviors are really weird. They do weird, really weird things. And you may have to do some interesting things to get the most out of behavioral anomaly detection and being able to capture that in the sticks taxi message sharing, I think is gonna be challenging, but I don't think it's gonna be hard. We just need to add a few more things to the schema to make them useful. So that's what I had. I'm sorry I went over time. I hadn't given this talk before, so. Um, I hope it was useful. Charlie, you're shaking your head. Uh, that was supposed to be yes. It was. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, that's supposed to be a nod. So, Ladrina, <laughs> I can see your facial expression. You always seem to smile, regardless, I think, of what's going on. I hope that's uh, because you're always happy. I, I love learning is really the thing. And uh, just speaking personally, it's it's been quite a while since I've thought about Markov chains. So kind of bringing together different pieces of my world is really great and I'll I'll give uh, the floor back to others who might want to talk well the only thing I last thing I want to say all of the things that we used in the DHS, DHS um, pilot are all open source it's all stuff that you can do all of this stuff with um, the available Argus tools that we have and now with that we can read Zeek data you can do most of this stuff with with Zeek data. Um, there's a lot of learning to get to the, this point, but um, I'm hoping that the Open Cybersecurity Alliance can um, take advantage of uh, this kind of uh, work and realize that we can do this with open source technology, and hopefully it'll help us get a little bit farther down the path with indicators of behavior. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? So, oh, Carter, okay. first of all, I want to say thank you. We're running up on time, so one thing I wanted to know real quick um, are you comfortable sharing your contact information? Because oh yeah, absolutely. I'd like to point anybody here that has some more questions to be able to follow up directly with you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. So don't give out my social security number though. One two three four five <laughs> six, six seven, seven eight nine. Eight, nine. <laughs> <laughs> it's right up there with the zip code for Schenectady. Um, I, don't, I don't know how the IOB working group wants to do with long conversations, but we can have these conversations anywhere at any time. I love talking about this stuff. So yeah. the anybody... Slack is a great, the Slack, I highly recommend for folks. I know we've had some challenges getting everybody hooked up there, but um, we can definitely work with Oasis to uh, get anybody who, who wants access to the Slack in there. It's a great place to kind of have these longer form conversations, at least to start them. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be my, my first, my biggest recommendation so that we don't always have to wait a month to come back around. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so.
so I'll uh, I'll make I'll Ladrina and I will work to make sure we can send out, we'll send out some information on the on joining the Slack for those that might not have it. Uh, cool. But, and we'll also send out uh, on the Slack in an email. Uh, your uh, I'm assuming the quotient email is the best one for you, right, Carter? Yes. Yep. Yep. That works. That's the best one. Cool. Uh, and we will uh, we'll direct folks to that because uh, unfortunately. It time flies when you're having fun, and we're right on time for the uh, the end. I believe, on a quick housekeeping note, correct me if I'm wrong, Ladrina, but I believe we're looking to go back to our normal schedule in May. So it won't be that long till we see each other again. But I uh, wanted to let everybody know we just had with uh, the spring holidays here in the U.S. and people's vacations. Things weren't working out too well to do it last week, so we're uh, so May tenth, one p.m. Uh, U.S. Eastern, will be our uh, our next one. Thanks for putting that in the chat, Ladrina, so I could casually look down and pretend that I had the calendar memorized. Um, but with that said, uh, I I know a couple of us could stick around. I can stick around for a few minutes if anyone wants to continue chatting. But otherwise, I'll just thank you again, Carter, and wish everybody good day and we'll be sending out some notes uh in the coming days along with carter's uh email so that you can spam them and ask them lots of questions like i like to do and thanks for the opportunity to talk i really appreciate it guys absolutely sir all right thank you everybody until next time and irena if you're you're still out there i think we can uh stop the recording okay and